Hey all you cool cats, welcome back to Read Aloud with Miss Godfrey. It is Tuesday, it is a rainy day here in Townsend, Tennessee. The weather has just, I mean it's been so nice lately and it's just taken a turn and now it is raining, but that is okay because rainy weather outside means perfect weather to read inside and that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be reading Schooled by Gordon Corman. We are about six chapters in at this point. We are going to be reading two chapters today, okay? I didn't want to just leave you with one. I wanted to give you a special treat for this Rainy Tuesday and give you two chapters. So that's what we're going to be doing today, okay? So if you've been listening so far to our daily reads, you know that we have a young man named Capricorn Anderson who has lived on a farm hippie commune with his grandmother. Something happens to her and he has to go live with a social worker for some, for some, for some short time and he has to go to school for the first time because he has been homeschooled. He has never really been around people and he goes to school. He goes to middle school and at this middle school they had this little thing they did to eighth graders where they elect the biggest nerd in school to be the class president their eighth grade year. And Capricorn Anderson was the perfect candidate for that, so they have elected him president. And we are learning all about his fun time doing that. So we're going to be continuing reading today. I'm going to be reading you chapters seven and eight today. Chapter seven is from the perspective of Mrs. Donnelly. If you remember back to chapter, I think it was two, uh, Mrs. Donnelly is a social worker. She used to be a member of the Garland Farm Commune, but she kind of left that, kind of left that behind. So now she is a social worker. She's a daughter of her own. Her daughter cannot stand Cap. Like, she wants nothing to do with him. She thinks he's a big loser and that he's going to ru ruin her social life. So, we're going to read from Mrs. Donnelly's perspective today. I'm so excited. Um, can't wait to see what happens. So, without further ado, y'all. School, Gordon Corman, Chapter 7, from the perspective of Mrs. Donnelly. Here we go. It says, as Cap's caseworker, part of my job was to check in with the school from time to time to make sure he was doing well. That's how I wound up having lunch with Frank Kasigi, the assistant principal at Claveridge Middle School. Uh, don't worry about Cap from an academic standpoint, he assured me. He's right up there with our brightest and our best. Commune or no, he's been very well educated by someone. I thought of Rain and I shuddered, even after all of these years. She had always been the teacher at Garland. For someone who rejected all forms of authority, she was a major tyrant in the classroom. If she hadn't adopted the hippie lifestyle, she would have made a terrific marine drill sergeant. Then Mr. Kasigi let the other shoe drop. Yet, socially, in my entire teaching career, I have never met a student who knows so little about ordinary, everyday living. Have you ever worked with any other students from this Garland farm? Only one, I replied faintly. She had a very difficult adjustment. I didn't bother to mention that the she was me. Adjustment is one thing, but Cap is like a space traveler who just landed on Earth and left his guidebook on the home world. Is it possible that he honestly believes that bullfighting is a sport that we play here in middle school? Bullfighting? I repeated. How did that subject come up? His reply posed far more questions than it answered. Apparently, Cap had asked about it as part of his duties as 8th grade president. 8th grade president? How could a brand new student who didn't, didn't know a soul in the place get himself elected president? It made no sense to me. But later on, my 16-year-old daughter acted like it was the most obvious thing in the world. Duh! 8th grade president isn't an honor, mother. It's like being elected the village idiot. Every year they pick the biggest wingnut in the building. It must have seemed like the freakazoid dropped straight from heaven to fill that post. I was horrified. Sophie, that's awful. She shrugged. What's really awful is that you're a social worker with power over kids' lives and you have no clue about what's common knowledge at that school. Did this happen when you were in eighth grade? Do you remember Caitlin Tortolo? She didn't really win a semester in Europe. She left school early because she had a nervous breakdown. And you participated in it? Everybody did, she retorted. At least, we did nothing to stop it. If you don't go along with the gag, you're next. I must have looked disapproving because she added, oh, Grow up, mother. That world's a big, tough, scary place. Oh, like you don't know that. Actually, I did know that. I didn't realize that she knew that. I felt t terrible for poor Cap. It was hard enough for him to come out of total isolation at Garland without having to be dropped into the snake pit that was middle school. 
Worse, I couldn't even warn him about it. Not without poisoning his one and only experience of the real world. My sole consolation lay in the fact that he would have to suffer this abuse only for just a few weeks more. His grandmother was recovering well. I'm sure he would have liked to visit her more often, but the facility was an hour away, even more with traffic, and there just wasn't time to take him during the week. Anyway, deep in my heart, I believed that a genuine school, nasty and merciless as it could be, was still better than Garland Farm. Besides, nastiness was relative. After school, Cap had to come home to my house, where Sophie was there to demonstrate the true meaning of nasty. She hated Cap Anderson with a passion that I wouldn't have believed her even capable of, and I was her mother. Even when he did things that had nothing to do with Sophie, he took, she took them personally. His healthy vegetarian diet she considered a slap in the face to her own eating habits. His neatness was a deliberate ploy to make her appear to be messy. She couldn't bear that Cap woke up early to practice yoga on our front, on our front lawn. But Sophie, I tried to reason with her, why would it matter to you? You're barely even awake at that hour. It's humiliating, she raged. We might as well put a sign on the roof that says, Warning, Mutant on Premises. The next morning when Cap was performing the dance-like martial arts move by the dogwood bushes, my darling daughter emptied an entire wastebasket full of water down on his head. This was followed, or excuse me, this she followed with a string of language that it would have set fire to the sidewalk. All from the girl who was concerned about what the neighbors might think. He looked up at her and smiled, instead of heaving a rock through her window, which is what I would have done. Oh, what a sight he was. With all that hair hanging limply around his shoulders, he looked like a weeping willow in soggy sandals. According to Sophie, this entire incident was my fault. By bringing Cap into our home, I had left her no choice but to take matters into her own hands. Since Sophie was never going to apologize to Cap, I did it myself. I'm so sorry, dear, I said, handing him a towel and handing him a towel that wouldn't have dried one tenth of his abundant hair. You have to forgive Sophie, although I can't think of a reason why. He looks sad. She doesn't like me. I smiled. Sixteen year old girls don't like anybody. His answer brought me straight back to my garland days. When you're unkind to others, it's usually because you don't believe that you yourself deserve kindness. Don't be so nice, I said. She can be pretty mean. In her defense, she's been through a lot in the past couple of weeks. Her father, my ex-husband, his heart's in the right place, but he makes a lot of promises that he can't keep. And Sophie ends up caught in the middle. Just yesterday, she was waiting for him to pick her up for her first driving lesson. He never showed. That's him. Doesn't come. Doesn't call. Just dead air. She won't admit it, but she is devastated. He looks thoughtful. I guess when you have a lot of people in your life, there's more of a chance that someone will let you down. I laughed. You're right, but it's a risk that most of us are prepared to take. Cat looked dubious. He had grown up with exactly one person in his life, Rain. And regardless of what I thought of her, to him, she had been the constant, she had been as constant as the rising sun. How terrifying must it be to lose that? All right, guys, that was chapter seven, Mrs. Donnelly. We see that Sophie is still being horrifically mean to poor Cap. We learn that Mrs. Donnelly has found out what being eighth grade president means. I wonder if she's going to tell Cap. That makes me wonder. Um, but we're going to go back, to, or we're going to go forward to chapter eight. Chapter eight is written from the perspective of Cap. So we get to see Capricorn Anderson's perspective once again. Um, and we're going to see how he's feeling, okay? He's got a lot to like take in with being in middle school, being in a new home, dealing with Sophie, trying to navigate this world he's never been a part of. So we're going to see what Cap has to say here in chapter eight. So are you ready? Let's go. It says, I really missed Rain. My whole life, whenever I got confused, there she would be to explain it all to me. One time, I remember we were in Rutherford laying in a supply of tofu. Tofu. We grew our own fruits and vegetables at Garland, but everything else had to be brought in from outside. Then we stopped at the hardware store to stock up on duct tape, which was just about the most useful thing on earth at a farm commune. It repaired roofs, walls, pops, cars, furniture, and boots. At least a quarter of Garland was held together with duct tape. It made an instant cast for a broken finger and it even pulled splinters out of your skin. Before I was born, there were lots of young children growing up in the community. All of those diapers used to be fastened with squares of duct tape. Can you imagine a diaper being just like duct taped on? That's hilarious. 
But when we got to the store, there was a group of people blocking the entrance. They were carrying signs and chanting. They seemed to be really angry about something. Rain explained that the employees were on strike, standing up for fair treatment. She thought it was an excellent idea. She refused to cross the picket line, so we drove 20 miles out of our way to buy our duct tape. We came back, though, and marched with the strikers for a couple of hours. Rain even let me unscrew the knobs to let the air out of the tires of the boss's car. Ooh. Rain said the trip was the purest form of education, learning by doing. I sure could have used that kind of wisdom now with so much going on in my life and so many things that I just did not understand, like bullfighting. I asked Mrs. Donnelly about it, but she... But the subject seemed to really bother her. She advised me to ignore anyone who mentioned it again. So I looked it up in the encyclopedia, and I figured out why Mrs. Donnelly was so upset. Bullfighting is a cruel sport where innocent animals are tormented, tortured, killed, and have their ears cut off. Oh, how sad. I needed Rain more than ever to ask her why a school would have anything to do with that. But she was out of the picture. This was the decision I would have to make on my own. And I did. The next time I saw Zach Powers, I put my foot down. I am not going to be asking Mr. Kasigi any more about bullfighting. I object to it on moral grounds. He said, I respect your honesty, and shook my hand. As he walked away, I noticed his shoulders were shaken. Overcome with emotion, I guess. Which really, we know, he was laughing, right? I was beginning to see that growing up... Growing up, not only... Uh, Y'all, I'm not even able to read today. Let me start that over. I was beginning to see that growing up knowing only one other person had some serious disadvantages. Without Rain as my mentor and guide, I was lost. The school made me dizzy. I spent half my time wandering the halls asking people directions to rooms they'd never even heard of. Students were constantly peppering me with questions that I didn't even have answers to. And now some girl named Lorelai Lumley was writing me notes about how she'd love to run her fingers through my hair. <sighs> Why would anyone want to do that? The closest thing I had to Rain was Hugh Winkleman. Hardly a replacement, but at least he was willing to help. We ate lunch together every day and I found myself honestly looking forward to that regular meeting where Hugh could explain things to me. It's obvious, he said. She's in love with you. <sighs> I don't even know who she is. I hadn't learned more than 15 or 20 names at this point. He was disgusted. Oh, typical. I spent my whole life in this dumb town and I've never gotten a girl to give me a second look. And here you have someone named Lorelai just throwing herself at you. You can't let that slip through your fingers. Ask her to the Halloween dance. What's the Halloween dance? Only the most important social event of the school year. Not that I've ever been to one. His eyes narrowed. If you're eighth grade president, shouldn't you know about it? I hope not, I said worriedly. Hugh looked dubious. Well, you probably shouldn't you probably shouldn't go by me. I'm not exactly Mr. Popularity around here, but I think the president plans the whole shindig. Refreshments, decorations, music. Something tingled directly beneath the peace sign I wore around my neck. I was developing a sixth sense for when trouble was coming my way. But what good was an advance warning? Advance warning of what? I wasn't going to understand it anyway. Maybe that was my mistake, even trying to understand. Garland was so simple. Seven acres of land containing exactly one house, one barn, a vegetable garden, fruit trees, a pickup truck, and only one other person. Maybe in a place as complex, complex as C average middle school, it was impossible to analyze every single thing that happened. Like, what were those little white paper balls that I kept brushing out of my hair every night? Was there so much paper in a school that the molecules eventually clustered and fell like precipitation and rain? And how did a pickled brain and all those other weird objects get into my locker? I thought the whole point of a lock was that no one could open it but me. I sure never put pink goo in a dead bird in there. Rain always recommended meditation for stress and confusion. But if you meditate in front of your locker, someone might steal your sandals while your eyes are closed. I had to go home barefoot on the school bus that afternoon. I know, I know that complaining is a negativity trip, but it was hard to stay positive about the floor of a school bus. It's, a, it's like a collecting place for the filthy, smelly, sticky, and often sharp and jagged cast-offs of a society run wild. If I'd ever questioned why Rain and her friends gave up on City Live in San Francisco and founded Garland back in 1967, five minutes on that school bus explained it to me. 
The dark underbelly of the human animal was turned loose on that vehicle. It was crowded, it was noisy, it was dirty, rowdy, and uncomfortable. People fought, people yelled, they threw things at one another, and they tormented the poor, helpless driver. It was an insane asylum on wheels. By the time I made it to the Donnelly house, my bruised and bleeding feet were decorated with lollipop sticks, chewing gum, hairs, broken soda can tabs, straws, buttons, and some things I couldn't even identify. To make matters worse, Sophie caught me in the backyard hosing off my feet at the outdoor tap. Nice, she muttered. But the thing is, her expression, her, expression, her, her expression said that she didn't think it was nice at all. Lately, every time I talked to Sophie, she looked like she had just eaten some turnips that had been harvested a week too late. Her face twisted into an unpleasant contortion that made it hard to see how beautiful she was. But I tried my best because I knew about her disappointment over her father and the driving lessons. I realized my good fortune at being raised by Rain, who never broke a promise and never let me down in any way. The more I thought about it, the more I wanted to do something nice for sweet Sophie to make her feel better. But how could that ever happen? Every time I went near her, she practically bit my head off. All right, guys, that is chapter eight. Wow, two chapters in one day of School by Gordon Corman. We are moving right along. I hope you enjoyed these two chapters today. I know for a fact that I did. It was so fun to hear about poor Cap and just the stuff he's dealing with. Bless his heart. So more to come. Um, tomorrow we'll pick up and we'll read chapter nine, maybe 10 if we're lucky. Um, so anyway, I hope you have a great day. I hope you're enjoying your distance learning. I hope you're enjoying your virtual time and some time at home. Like I said earlier, it's raining outside. So maybe find you a nice book if you have one and read some on your own. If not, just listen to School by Gordon Corman. Anyway, have an amazing Tuesday and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye.